Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. We are looking at the book of Ephesians uh, this week and the next couple of weeks, and I encourage you to read along with us uh, because we're really looking at how God calls us in Jesus. And so last week we kind of looked at Ephesians 1 and we saw it's very similar to how God called Abraham. When God called Abraham, he said, Abraham, I'm going to call you and you're going to be some part of something bigger where I'm going to use your family to bless all the nations of the earth. So rather than curling in on yourself, I'm going to use you to bring my blessing to all those around me. And we looked at how, how Abraham kind of curled in on himself a little too much, but how God was so faithful in his calling. God still got Abraham to be that blessing that, that he, he needed him to be, or he called him to be. And we talked about how God does the same thing for us, despite us curling in on ourselves, that God has saved us by his grace and, and, and empowers us to follow that same calling to be a blessing of those around us, sort of with open arms. And that was kind of Ephesians 1, and so today we're in Ephesians chapter 2, and Ephesians chapter 2, if you've been part of a Lutheran church for any length of time, I guarantee you, you probably have heard some of these verses. I, I remember when I was uh, uh, kind of just understanding what Lutherans believed, it was like Reformation Day, and there was a play at the church I was a part of, and it was like, and Luther found these two verses in Ephesians, and then all of a sudden he saw the gospel. It was a little bit oversimplified. But these verses aren't oversimplified. They, they pack what the gospel is all about. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Let's see if we can look at those. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Anybody like that verse? Yeah, right? We're like, yeah, it's like the rallying cry of Lutherans, right? For by grace you have been saved. Not a result of what you have done and not a result of what you haven't done, right? God saved you. God loves you simply because of his grace and his love that he sent Jesus to die and rise for you. Therefore, God is pleased with you. Therefore, God draws you in solely because of Jesus. Not because of what you haven't done, not because of what you have done, but simply because God loves you. And that's awesome, right? That's why I'm here. That's why I'm probably a Lutheran. It's because this is how God works, and this is what we believe so fundamentally at our core, is that it's by grace we have been saved. But we love that verse, right? You see how it continues here? It's a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. I think sometimes we, we stop it, it's by grace you've been saved, and we stop there. So that no one may boast. Because we like to boast, don't we? I mean, we don't like it when people boast around us, but I think it's in our core, it's in our nature that we boast, don't we? I know um, a couple days ago, Friday, I was uh, volunteering at my son's school. It was field day with a bunch of elementary school kids, younger elementary school kids. And I volunteered in the kindergarten through second grade section. And when I showed up, they were short on volunteers. Uh, my wife works at the school. She texted me in the morning. She's like, we really need volunteers. Can you please come? And I, just, I was like, okay, it was my day off. So I went down there, not prepared to do anything. And it, I, I showed up right when I was put, like, almost like five minutes late because um, I got the, the call. They needed help last minute. And they assigned me tug of war of kindergarten through second graders. And, and, and guess what I heard for about a good hour that I was there? The different groups would come through and guess who was the greatest at tug of war? No, well, I, I showed them that, I showed them that. But no, all, that's what all the kids said. Well, no, 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 we're, we're so much better than them. We're so, and, and, and like, even if they, got, if they lost, they're like, no, 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 we're the greatest. That wasn't fair, there was cheating done there. And, and I, I realize that's sort of in our, in our nature, is boasting. It's being proud kind of at the expense of our neighbor. And I, I was thinking about that kind of throughout the weekend and throughout the week, that that's sort of the nature of our sin. We, we want to boast about ourselves at the expense of our neighbor. 
And I thought about sort of some of the callings that we're, we look at in the Bible, and, and today we're, we're really looking at Moses' calling as well. And, and Moses, for the early part of his life, he had a lot he could boast about. I mean, the very, very early part of his life, when he was like floated down a river as a Hebrew boy uh, and, and needing to be saved by Pharaoh's family, that, that wasn't a lot to boast about. But once he got saved by Pharaoh's family, it was raised as like a prince of Egypt, man, he had it all. Right? He could go kind of wherever he wanted to go. He had all the power of Pharaoh behind him. Like everything was good for Moses. I remember what he did one day. This is very early on in Exodus. I think it's right in the middle of Exodus chapter 2. Right? He went out. He had a heart for the Hebrew people, and he went out to the Hebrew people. And remember what he saw? He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew. And remember what he just decided to do on a whim that day? Oh, well, let's kill the Egyptian. And he murders the Egyptian. He tries to sort of cover it up, and he thinks that nobody has seen it right? And then, so what does he do? Like, he goes back home, everything's fine. What does he do the next day? Well, he goes back out to the same place, and what does he find? He finds the, uh, uh, whoops, he finds, he goes out the next day, he says, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together. And look what he says, he says, he says to the man in the wrong, why do you strike your companion? Like, why are you guys getting in a fight? Like, come on, you guys got to be better than this. And he sends that there's just a little bit of arrogance there. Right? There's, there's just a little bit of, of pride, just a little bit of boasting there with Moses. He had everything all together. And as I was thinking about that, I, I was thinking about those second graders I saw on Friday. Right? And that's what they were doing. It's like, why? You know, you're not holding it right. If you guys would just hold the rope better, we'd be better, right? That's what they were doing. They, they were boasting and telling everybody else what to do. And I thought about how many times we do that in our own faith. Right? Rather than standing in what God has done for us, how many times is it tempting for us to boast about ourselves and how great of Christians we are? And we typically do that at the expense of the sinners around us. Right? We say, look at people in that sin that we maybe don't participate in. We go, oh, have you, have you heard of that person over there? Woo-hoo-hoo! I thank God I'm not like that guy over there right? I don't do that. I'm, I'm holy, right? I go to church every Sunday, not like that heathen over there, right? And we end up calling out the other people and sins to really feel better about ourselves, and we forget that we're not saved by works. We forget that it's by grace that we have been saved, and we, we end up boasting at the expense of our neighbor, and we end up sort of putting up a dividing wall of hostility that's there, and it's hurtful. Right? And maybe, maybe you've been on the receiving end of that dividing wall that's there. Right? Maybe when, you, when we were like growing up, there was a, a parent or a mentor or a grandparent in your life with this like, oh gosh, it's you again. Right? I just wish you could be like Jeffrey over there. Right? If you could just be like Jeffrey over there, man, oh, he's such the perfect grandchild, and you, you're always getting into trouble. Like, how does that feel? Does that make you want to run to that person? No, it puts up a wall there. It makes you, you feel unloved. It makes you feel like you're not worthy. And that's what our boasting does. Our, our boasting puts up this dividing wall of hostility between us and our neighbors. We fall into the temptation, I think, because of our sin. We're, we love to boast. And we love to feel good about what we're doing, but, but we forget that it's by grace we have been saved. That really, when, when things aren't going right, in the midst of our sin, that's when Jesus comes and, and Christ dies for the ungodly. The Apostle Paul, he puts it this way. He says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. As we're lost in our sin, we're not called to be better Christians than the person over there. But we're called by God who saves us by his blood, who destroys that dividing wall between us and God. It's gone through the blood of Jesus. As God joins you at the time of your lowest time, at the time of your greatest weakness, Jesus dies for you, and he rises for you. 
For by his love and his grace, you have been saved. That's what it's all about. That dividing wall between you and God has been torn down. Jesus himself is our peace. When Jesus comes to earth, you want to know one thing he never says? <laughs> you better try harder. He never says, you better do better. Jesus never says, you better be more like Jeffrey over there. No, Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. And he takes on all the burdens you have as he dies on the cross and rises for you, for by grace you have been saved. And, and this is the, the same thing I think that Moses experiences. He's a little bit arrogant, and he's like, ah, why, why, why are you striking your brother there? And remember what the guys say back to Moses? Well, are you going to kill us like you killed the Egyptian? And all of a sudden, Moses realizes that everybody knows the thing that he thought he did in secret, secret is out in the open. And Pharaoh comes running after Moses. And where does Moses end up in Exodus chapter 3? We just read it. He ends up out in the middle of nowhere, on the run, as an outcast from Egypt, tending not even his own sheep, but the sheep of his father-in-law. Talk about a swing from going from high to low. Moses had it all. He was the prince of Egypt, and now he has messed up, he has failed, he's an outcast out in the middle of nowhere. And guess where God shows up? The angel of the Lord shows up in the burning bush. God calls Moses in the middle of nowhere from that burning bush and says, Moses, Moses, I've heard the cries of my people. I have come down to deliver them, and I'm going to use you. And sure, Moses goes back, and, and he speaks to Pharaoh, and of course, you know, Pharaoh doesn't want to let him go. But God shows his power, and God rescues his people from the land of Egypt through his sort of prophet Moses, who at the time when God called him, I think was at about the lowest you could possibly be. And it might be tempted to say, well, oh, no, no, Moses was the one that rescued the people. But if you remember who Moses was, Moses wasn't anybody very eloquent. He wasn't really anybody very special. I mean, he, he wasn't a good public speaker. But through everything that Moses did, God was behind him. God was bringing peace to his Hebrew people. God was delivering and rescuing his people as he divided, you know, the, the, the Red Sea, as, as he gave the, the plagues, as he, as, he, as he rescued his people out of Egypt. God used Moses to do that. That's sort of what Moses pointed to, is my God, right? My God's the one that's going to rescue you out of Egypt. And God did that. God worked to bring peace to his people, just as God works to bring peace through the blood of Jesus for you and me. And God calls you very much in the same way. He doesn't say, shape up, and then I'm, I'm going to use you. He, he meets you as you're an outcast. And by his blood gives you his peace and invites you to that same calling that Moses has. And I like what Paul says about this. In Ephesians chapter 3, Paul kind of sums this up, that he hopes that this is what happens for us. He says, And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know that this love that surpasses knowledge. Paul says, I want you to know how wide and deep and long and high the love of Jesus is for you. As you experience that, for by grace you have been saved, he calls you to go out. <laughs> Not to go save a bunch of other people, because Jesus has already done that but point to the peace that God has for them in Jesus. That they too might experience how wide and long and high and deep the love of Christ is for them as well. For it's by grace you have been saved. Amen. May the peace that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.